Okay, uh, thanks Celia, thanks for having me. Quite excited to be here. Um, quite amazed I'm actually on the same stage as some of the other um, talkers, uh, speakers. Um, so this is my talk. Um, I'm gonna first briefly give a bit of background on myself um, and you know where the research is also coming from, which I'm gonna talk about. So my parents never really took a picture of me as a kid when playing video games, but I did play video games in the 80s. Uh, so I just took a picture of my daughter who's playing Battlefield here, but she also plays you know, Splatoon and other kinds of things. Um, I grew up with games, I studied uh, computer science, I got a master in computer science, thought like I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna do great, I'm gonna make games, and I ended up doing, you know, uh, just a boring software uh, development in some HR company, sadly enough. Uh, I started playing World of Warcraft to forget about my, you know, real life, um, and then at some point I quit, and you know, when you quit World of Warcraft, things happen, and I was able to fi find a job in games development. Uh, the glamorous life of uh, games development uh, right here is pretty much the same as before, but now I have a controller on my desk. So I worked in this game, was the um, UI developer, the only UI developer to start, and then uh, had some juniors join me um, on this amazing game. I don't really like motorcycles, but you know, it's game development, so I was happy. Uh, I quit it after the, the project was finished, and then I started uh, doing all other stuff, and ended up in, uh, in academia, eventually. Um, I did a PhD at a human-computer interactions group in Leuven, in Belgium. Um, and then I did a postdoc and then I started freelancing because, you know, I like to change things up quite a bit. Uh, my talk is going to be mostly about the parts in, um, during my academic research and during the freelancing. So, my PhD was about something completely different. It was about learning analytics. So, what that is, is we track, you know, activities students do, um, things they do online, but maybe also in the classroom if we have the means. And then we try to use that data to give them, you know, insights and awareness of how they're progressing through their, uh, you know, education and all that. Um, it wasn't around the time that Quantify itself became very popular and that we saw the activity trackers and stuff, you know, like the Apple Watch, which uh, was mostly focused on health. We were doing something similar, but then focused on education. There is two ways to approach this. There's uh, the machine learning on the left. Um, and there's a nice paper there which does a nice job with showing a traffic light which says like if it's red you're screwing up, if it's green you're doing great. So it's not very useful but it gives some indication. Uh, in our research group we were more, more focused on uh, what you know you call the augmenting the human intellect. So we wanted to use data visualization to give people insights into um, in, in, into their you know into their data of their studying and whatever they were doing. So I worked on quite a bunch of projects, made um, dashboards in all kinds of situations, you know, for using in collaborative ways, uh, for putting in the classroom, um, for uh, advising, uh, you know, counseling of students, of first year students as well. Uh, and as you can see, I use like big table quite often because, you know, if you have a large tabletop in the office, you have to use it. Uh, so that brings me to, you know, the topic at hand. Now, I was working in learning analytics. Uh, I was always passionate about games. I thought, like, is there no way I can actually integrate games into my research? Uh, and I would not have been able to do it without these people. Um, we had no budget uh, at all. Um, I was allowed to, like, work one day a week on this topic. I got the help of these people uh, among a couple, you know, a professor at the top and then uh, a bunch of students, another professor at the bottom, uh, helping me do some research around esports. Now, usually use UX in games focuses on the player, right? We're um, looking at how to improve the player's um, uh, you know, experience with the game. You know, we're helping them memorize things by you know, just showing the things so they don't have to memorize them, um, helping them you know, in being immersed in this, in this world, right? Uh, then there's, you know, there was the arrival of Twitch, uh, and then we had to think about, okay, so how can we now look at, you know, there's interesting new things happening, we have people watching people play, so there's interaction between the streamer and the uh, audience, there's also sometimes like here this with the Twitch play example, um, the audience actually interacting with the game as well. And we took another approach, we said like, okay, what about esports? We have an audience here who can't interact with the game, who cannot interact with the players, because they're you know, very focused on trying to win this game. Um, so what can we do for them? And you know, these, these games are really fast paced, um, and it's not, a, it's not a single sort of player environment, so we, we wanna 
you know, there's lots of stuff going on at the same time. So how can we help spectators understand this? And we, with that, we mean like you know people who are ex, you know already expert spectators, if you can call them that, but also people who are new to the game, you know, trying to understand how these games work. So we focused on two games, well, two, well, two, first, two types of games, first-person shooters and MOBAs. Uh, we took League of Legends and uh, Counter-Strike. And we, um, we, you know, we took the normal user-centered approach, because we were, sci well, I was a scientist, so we have to do it the proper way. Uh, we we're trying to understand, you know, what the users want, what they, what they actually need. Uh, then we did a user-centered design process, where we just went through these iterations of designing a dashboard uh, for both games. And then we did a final evaluation to you know, figure out what did we learn and you know, where can we improve. Uh, first of all, so in send the user needs, we uh, send a survey to Reddit, a great place to do these kind of things. We get a lot of response on, on um, Counter-Strike, a little bit less on League of Legends, sadly enough. Uh, but still, you know, 788 participants in our survey and we asked them questions about you know, what motivates them to watch these kinds of games, um, what's the perceived usefulness of, of the specific statistics that are used uh, you know, in, in, in these games, uh, to figure out you know, what should we design. Um, based on these results, we did um, a usability testing. Uh, so we did the iterative design and with a focus on usability first, right? We just want to make something that people understand that people can use. Uh, we did, you know, think aloud, um, we did semi-structured interviews and we had about, I think it was 18 participants. So we started with paper prototyping, then we created digital mock-ups and then uh, we ended up with interactive prototype which worked with real uh, data of video games. And we ended to you know, figure out what we've learned uh, with a larger um, sort of study where we sat down with people for uh, 20 minutes, having them watch a game with the dashboard running, uh, you know, having them think out loud what they saw, um, having questionnaires about that, also uh, you know, doing eye tracking to figure out where they're looking, uh, and did an inductive thematic analysis on the entire thing um, to figure out, you know, okay, what did we learn? So, a bunch of uh, themes came out of that. We had about 500, um, um, I forgot the word. Anyway, we had, we had all these themes. I'm gonna, not going to detail of all of them, but I'll explain a little bit about the results in a sec. First, I'm going to show you the uh, dashboard. So, the first one uh, was made by the student Brahm that you saw up there, is the Counter-Strike dashboard. Now, um, at the top, you see uh, the rounds won and how they were won. So, you know, by winning, by uh, um, killing everyone the other opposite team, uh, or uh, defusing the bomb, or actually having the bomb explode. Um, you have also the, you know, information regarding the players and their statistics on the right. You have the money distribution as well, because money is really important to figure out if, you know, someone's going to win a match or not. Uh, and average damage per round, right? Okay, so we did something similar for uh, League of Legends, it was done by Hans. Um, here we have, it's, it's a bit more complicated because the game is more complicated as well. We show uh, at the top, there's so many screens here. At the top we see um, gold distribution, how that's going through time, you know, how the gold is distributed across both teams. We have the damage, and we can actually see you know, damage uh, from recent team fights uh, updating live, and vulnerability at the bottom, which I'll get back to later. Uh, Hans also visualized uh, the path the jungler is taking. The jungler is the guy who's not in a specific lane, is just like jumping between lanes and going through the jungle uh, and ganking people, so he was also visualizing uh, this information. This is a little video where you can see it in action. Uh, so you can see the live stream, well, it's actually a YouTube video, but you can see the stream on the left, and you can see the dashboard updating on the right with you know, the live information of what's going on in the game. Uh, this is the one for League of Legends. If we wait a little bit, we'll get the Counter-Strike one. So as you can see, it's... Um, it's updating live, it's actually, Counter-Strike is using the demo files um, from the, the replays from the games. Um, for the League of Legends one, we were using the API uh, for the, that actually uh, Riot provides for their own um, interface uh, during matches. So, came up with a bunch of design goals. Now, you shouldn't take, you know, these are, you should sort of take from every little pillar a little bit. It depends what you choose in one, how it affects the other one. So I'll just go through uh, these uh, real quick. So first of all, we have glanceability. So we're putting a lot of extra information now on the screen for the, for the spectator, right? It's already hard to follow, so here's some more information. Um, so we're also distracting them, um, and you know, we're, we're 
sorry, we're, in, you know, we're impacting the cognitive load of these, of, of these spectators. Now, so we have to look at a lot of things like, you know, how should we use animation, shouldn't, you know, things shouldn't take too much attention from the game and all that. Uh, we should maybe have as le the least, in, least amount of interaction possible even, uh, because, you know, people want to focus on the games. Um, and also, um, I lost my train of thought, sorry. Um, so there's a lot of research around ambient displays, which is really interesting. Uh, they have like these peripheral views and all that. There's a lot of research going on there that can be very beneficial for these kinds of uh, visualizations. Now, this is actually a quote. Um, you know, I might prefer to watch this thing later uh, because I need to be able to think about it. Like some people just find it way too distracting from their uh, you know, uh, viewer experience. And there's another one where someone just missed a team fight completely because they were looking, you know, they saw something move uh, in the damage, which, you know, starts jumping up and down, and then they just missed, missed the beginning of a team fight. So here's an overview also of the um, attention, where it was spent uh, from the eye tracking. Uh, you can see, I'm sorry for the colorblind people, but it's the first column is blue, and you can see there's a lot of attention, okay, on the stream, which is great. And then you have green, which is the second one, which is attention to the dashboard. Uh, if you look at, for example, the eighth participant, sorry, participant eight, the one on the right top, uh, he, spend a, or he or she spent a lot of time actually staring at the dashboard, so missed quite a bit of the game. Now, of course, we have to take into account the novelty factor. We show something new, so people's attention will be on that, of course, and there's the evaluation sort of, you know, situation where people are supposed to look at the dashboard as well. They think like, okay, I've got to pay attention to this thing. Um, here's some more visualizations of that where you see where the attention is spent. So the right part is the uh, dashboard, and you can see most participants actually focus a lot on the dashboard. So it's not good, you know, we don't want to distract them too much from the game. Uh, then again, uh, esports viewers are used to having like an overload of information on their screen. So this is an example of Counter-Strike um, during the buying phase. In the buying phase, nothing happens except for players are buying stuff. The visualization isn't really great and all the streams are doing the same thing. But you could imagine, you know, we don't really need the map, we don't need the health bars, there's no point at this specific point in the game, right? And that brings me to the thing about context. So, okay, so there's a lot of distraction and all that, but it all depends on the context as well. Uh, the context in, for example, game phases. Uh, you know, some parts of the games are boring. In League of Legends, there's the laning phase. There's not that much going on. People are not, you know, killing each other yet. So you can show more information there, right? Uh, on the other hand, you know, when there's a team fight breaking out, maybe you want to you want you want to show less information or only information related to the team fight, maybe even close to the to where the team fight is happening. Um, there's also the viewer type. Like some people are maybe interested in learning more and getting really deep into the details. Some people just might want to enjoy the game and get some really superficial information. Um, and then we have maybe you know if we go beyond spectators, you can even think team managers. You know can use really detailed information to actually help their team understand what's going on and what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. Uh, this is actually from our Reddit um, questionnaire where we asked, okay, what, what motivates you to watch these streams? And it's actually all about knowledge and skills of, 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 of the streamer. Uh, so knowledge about the game, skills of the streamer. You can imagine people watching football, you know, the kids going out on the playground and, and sort of reenacting things that, they're, that they're, you know, their uh, idols are doing. So it's pretty much similar to that. Um, then there's the need uh, for lightweight and flexible dashboards. So with that I mean, okay, so we've seen all these different contexts, now we can't really cater to all of them at the same time, that's pretty much impossible. So there's no one, one size fits all. Um, so we either create something very flexible, something very customizable, or we create them for very specific niches, right, for very specific target audiences. Um, it's, it's, it's also not only the content that we should change, there's also, from our analysis, we also saw there's a lot of questions about you know, the placement of this dashboard. We put it next to the stream because it just seemed logical. Um, on the other hand, people said, like, okay, we've got a chat already there. Everyone's fighting for screen, screen estate. Uh, you know, maybe second screen would be an option. Maybe a mobile phone would be an option. Um, and again, as I said before, we know we have all different phases in the game, so maybe we can also do different things depending on which phase uh, uh, is happening. And that brings me to, um, let's go to the next one, in, you know, intelligence, the, the, the topic intelligence. Uh, with that, we mean, okay, we can maybe automate lots of these things, right? So we can change a dashboard, like, we can change the information depending on the phase of the game. It's really easy to detect when the laning maybe ends, where, you know, specific goals have been met, we can move the visualization to a different, um, a, 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 a different um, 
you know, different visualization. Now, with that, we can also do stuff like direct the attention of the player, of the, of the spectator. You can use visualizations to sort of say, okay, something is going to happen. Something is going to happen and start looking at, you know, specific uh, regions. Uh, also for the caster, the people who are actually uh, doing the casting of the, of, the, you know, this, of the stream, we can help them figure out, you know, what to look at, you know, where is something going to happen. And it becomes really interesting when we start to play with prediction, right? We have all this historical data of the video game, so why not, you know, use that and, and create predictions regarding, okay, team fight is going to break out, chances of you know, team A winning versus team B are, are, are X percent, and, uh, and start giving more insights into, in, into the future. Now, we've done something similar. I mentioned briefly um, the design, uh, the, um, this is the design of a vulner vulnerability uh, sort of visualization. So what it does is it shows for each player how vulnerable they are, and it takes into account a bunch of uh, parameters uh, to sort of calculate this. And so, uh, for example, it's, if someone's low on health, it'll impact their vulnerability and you know, okay, this guy has a chance of dying real soon, right? Um, so we got positive response to that and here someone said like, okay, it helps me understand why the jungle is, for example, in, for example ganking someone. Uh, they, they can see, okay, they're taking a specific path and they know they're actually going to be ganked because, you know, you can see, see it from the, from, from the data. And that brings me to the last design goal, which is uh, trust. So the problem with, with prediction systems and recommender systems is, you know, you have to make sure people trust them. If they don't trust them, they're not going to use them. Uh, it's a big issue uh, in a lot of fields when we're talking about recommender systems. Uh, so some people appreciate it. Some people are like, okay, this is very valuable, but others doubt whether it's really correct. Um, and some people just say like, okay, it's, 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 it's data that I think I can figure out myself just from seeing, seeing what's going on. Um, and with this case, what we did was we visualized the different parameters that are involved into this recommend, recommendation, into this prediction, right? So if we visualize, for example, uh, here on the left and right, you see we visualize the health, we visualize the um, position of the player uh, towards the enemy players and towards their own team, like if they're far away from their own team, but close to the enemy, you know, vulnerability goes up. And also the cooldowns, if they're out of cooldowns and there's a good chance, you know, they won't be able to escape when they get ganked by the jungler, for example. And, you know, while this was appreciated, you know, still there's people who are like, I want to figure this out for myself, but this already improves the trust in the system, so they know what they're seeing is something trustworthy. And that, you know, that, that, that raises acceptance. Um, so I really went really briefly over this. Uh, if you want to read more details, there's an entire paper we published at Kai Play on, um, on, on, on the results of this research. But there's always the problem still, like, you know, how do we get the data? We use demo files for, for Counter-Strike, we use the API from Riot, but for most games there's not much available, right? So we did another thing, here's me <laughs> and uh, my colleague, well, back then, uh, Catherine Gerling, uh, at Kai Play in Melbourne, Aust Australia last year, where we presented a uh, sort of abstract uh, poster um, on a sort of open format for data, for video game data, right? Um, because all these different games have their own sort of data format and we could build so many cool things and certainly in academia when people are doing research it's so much effort to get that data first of all and then to you know get it into a format which you can do something with and for each game you would have to redevelop pretty much everything and that brings me to the last part of my talk is uh, about you know the actual application of all the stuff we did. I'm working together with a company called Grid uh, Esports in Berlin. They're amazing people. They're doing uh, all stuff data related um, regarding esports and they help you know, companies, uh, you know, they provide the data, they provide uh, championships with uh, data streams and visualization and overlays for uh, the streams. Now, as I said, the problem is data, and what they do is we, we, we actually worked out a sort of system where, okay, we need to first of all be able to extract the information, extract the data from the games, the metrics, and you can, you can go you know, to a specific point. At some point, you sort of run into issues because game developers or game companies won't give you the data. And with this sort of platform they're building, we're trying to convince companies that, okay, it's really useful because once you give us the data, all the stuff we can do with it is quite amazing. The thing is the platform and the products they're developing are uh, game agnostic, right? So we can build stuff. Uh, we, we created this sort of, well, I helped them create this sort of um, a generic sort of form, a data format, where we can just, you know, convert data from any game into it and then sort of output it again in a generic format, which we then we can build products on which can be used across different games. Here's an example of Dota, where they just made this as a, you know, a prototype where they, I think it's, is it animating? Yeah. So you can see, um, 
you, you can see, you know, we're using positional data and data regarding all the players. It's all updating live. Now, with only a little bit of work, they were able to do the same thing for Counter-Strike because of the generic data format, right? Of course, there's also specific things for specific games and specific game genres that's also being taken into account. Uh, other stuff is like, you know, upcoming games and statistics around games are also, uh, we're also able to build that quite game agnostic. Uh, and this is one of the latest things uh, we're working on currently. Um, I'm helping them figure out how to visualize predictions, like I mentioned earlier. You can see in the top left, it's gone now. <laughs> um, you can see that we're trying to um, visualize prediction, like who's going to win a match, right? And this is currently done with a um, sort of percentage, right? Okay, so X percent chance someone's going to win. And this is a, a collaboration they have also. They're now working together with Pinnacle uh, Esports. Uh, and it's interesting because, you know, it's pretty much the same problem we ran into earlier, like we're visualizing this prediction, but, you know, for users to accept that, you know, they're quite knowledgeable usually about these things, right? We've got these viewers who know these games, who are quite expert at these games. And we've noticed that, okay, if they're knowledgeable, we have to give them insights. So we're trying to figure out all these different ways of visualizing what's behind that information. And once we do that, once we get enough insights, you know, we're pretty sure we can get their trust. And now for something completely unrelated, well, it's related, but it's a completely different world, uh, something I worked on is we had this recommender system predicting jobs, right? Uh, pr predicting, like, let's say you want to become a teacher and using all your data, we sort of predict like, okay, you've got a 50% chance you're going to be a teacher within 120 days, you know, if you're applying for a job at least. Um, and what we do is we visualize all the parameters that the recommender system uses to sort of show why the prediction is made. So for example, uh, you know, your education, you didn't go, you know, didn't really go to school, so it's going to have a really bad impact on your uh, chances. Then again, uh, I think we're losing, the, for example, languages, you're really good at languages, that's going to up your chances. And that's great, we're getting all these insights, but we're also visualizing all the parts that impact, uh, that actually can improve your chances. So, you know, if you study X or Y, you know, chances go up. If you do this or that, chances go up. And I think we can do the same thing for games. We can have like very interesting visualizations where we show the, the spectator like, okay, you, this, this team is going to win. These are all the parameters why we think so, but these are all the things that could happen that could change it completely around, right? And I think that might be quite interesting. It might, well, it's something we still have to explore, but I think it's pretty cool. Uh, that sort of concludes my talk. I'm sorry, I talk really quickly and I had a lot of slides. Um, I'm a freelancer, so you know, networking is my lifeline, so if you want to hook up with me on LinkedIn or Twitter, uh, please feel free to do so. Sweet. Uh, so we have quite some time for questions. So let me check if there's a question there. Um, Okay, so is these are the most recent ones. Cause I, okay, so there's a bunch of questions there. Uh, did you have to filter out any trolling in the Reddit surveys? <laughs> well, it's part of the job, right? It's, uh, it, it, but it wasn't too bad. Uh, these people on Reddit are actually very passionate about the game. They see something like that, and they get really excited, and they want to, um, you know, they want to participate in these kinds of studies. Uh, actually, the Student Hans, who did uh, the first the survey on League of Legends, got his first job through that uh, survey, <laughs> of putting it online. So it's actually Grid that saw him um, do that stuff and responded. So, is there a question in the room? Can we throw over there, over here? Uh, there's one there if you want. <laughs> Aim well. Wow, <laughs> impressive. Hi. Uh, Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my question was, uh, maybe you've touched upon it, but uh, still. So you collect all this data, yeah, regarding the jobs or the game statistics. Uh, what is uh, used exactly to analyze and properly, uh, you know, uh, interpret this data into the scheme or the graphics we uh, see in the end? So like, so we have all this data regarding your job and you have this calculation that uh, is viewed in percentages. So what does exactly, what exactly does that thing that calculates it? Right, uh, it's not my expertise. I'm more of a data viz, pure data guy. I like to visualize things as they are and not, tr and not change them too much. That's what we mostly did in the learning dashboards as well. Um, but yeah, we have data scientists, you know, creating these models that actually predict, you know, use all these parameters and try to make predictions out of, out of the data we have. Uh, regarding the games, we, 
in most of the visualizations up until now, we just visualize what we have as is, right? You know, health, position, it's all quite straightforward. And we, you can visualize them in that way that you can abstract specific things so you don't have to show it all like they usually do in all the streams. Uh, I don't think that's very useful. Uh, so we do abstractions, that's one thing. We sometimes visualize them in different methods just, you know, to give it a bit... You know, a visual way is always a better way than just showing the numbers, right? Um, and, you know, comparison and all that. There's all, all kinds of um, visual te data -vis techniques we can use to actually Im improve that. But regarding the, the, the models and all that, um, I'm not an expert. I visualize output <laughs> and the input, but I'm not uh, occupied with the, whatever happens in the middle. <laughs> There's a question in there that how long have participants watched the games? Were there any habituation effects and were uh, they weren't as focused on the dashboard in later stages? Sorry, I didn't, didn't get So we can uh, put it on, on the okay. screen. So it says, how long have participants watched the games? Right. And were there any habituation effects where they weren't as focused on the dashboard in later stages? Um, as, as I mentioned before, we had like a, not a lot of time to do the research, right? We didn't have a budget at all. So we used the uh, master students to do the, uh, lots of the groundwork for us. Um, and this had to be done within one academic year, right? So by the time we had a finished dashboard, um, they were able to do some extended studies with 18 participants in total. Uh, and they all talked, talk, well, they all took about I guess in total it would have been an hour at least per participant and these students already have like a very full schedule. So in total they spent 20 minutes watching the, uh, the, the, the stream with the dashboard um, and then afterwards we showed them like 20 second fragments of interesting parts in the games where we were like okay this, these are like very you know a team fight breaking out or something and there we asked them like to, you know you can watch it again and we can you can really talk in detail about it while the other part was more we observed and see how they responded. So no, we didn't, we didn't sadly enough get to the point where we were able to do longer studies and see what the effect would be uh, long term and whether they would actually get used to ignoring <laughs> our work. I think there was another question in the audience. Yeah. When you start uh, your work, did you thought to, look, to see how people are watching sport on TV and how TV channel make uh, real-time editing for example, I'm thinking in tennis, when, when you have a hole, they show uh, some history of the, either the player or the party. Right, so regarding what regular sports does, yeah, so we're recently looking into that because you know, they've been around for so long. Uh, and it, interestingly enough, there's not that much going on in, in, in real sports broadcasting. They've got some nice visualizations on top of you know, the game, uh, which, which we haven't seen yet in video games, even though it's much easier for us to do, right? Um, but I think that the problem with regular sports is we have lots of statistics about players, but we don't have the real-time data like we have in video games. We, we don't, you know, they're, okay, they use trackers and all that to see where the players are on a football field and all that, but it's still, we have much more information. That's why it's a bit of, it's, it was interesting for me when I started the research that so little was done about this because we have so much data. I was spending four years trying to figure out how to get data from students, uh, you know, in the classroom, which is very annoying. <laughs> um, plus, you know, all the privacy issues you get with that. Um, and then there's this, you know, entire area with games where ev everything is in virtual worlds, so everything is measurable. Uh, and so I think we can take that way beyond what they're doing. Uh, but we can already learn a lot from, at least, I'm surprised that broadcasts now aren't using what regular sports are using, because it's so simple. You know, there's, there's su such simple visualization, simple data stuff. But they're not doing it. They're just saying, okay, let's use this. I think it's CSGO. They use whatever is standard and just drop all the data on the screen. And apparently spectators are happy with that, but I'm hoping we can improve on that quite a bit. Other questions in the audience? Yeah. That's here. <laughs> I'm going to stand back. I think. Head. Oh, no. <laughs> there you go. You could have killed some people there. <laughs> Hi. That thing is okay. dangerous. Oh, it's very loud. Um, I have two questions. The first one, what was the um, uh, beginning problem for your study? Like, what were the needs of the viewers that were not answered by, for example, for League of Legends, the dashboard and the comment of the casters that were already provided on streams? And second, what is the application of your work now for Riot Games, for example? Did they use what you did or 
What did you develop with that? Right. Uh, well, we started off with uh, so the Reddit surveys, right, to figure out what people wanted. It's a, it's, it's a very small group still, right? We see it's much broader than the responses we got there. Um, but th these are experts or the viewers. They play the game. They know the game. They want just more. It's, that's actually the only thing they want, just more data, more information. Uh, and I don't think it's ideal for everyone because we want to introduce also new, new people to the games. Um, I think someone watching League of Legends, I only started learning about League of Legends when I was doing the research because I didn't play it before, I had to like get into it. And it's a complicated game and also when stuff is going on it's very hard to follow. So I think there was a lot of potential, certainly for new viewers, right. And currently, um, so I, I'm a freelancer, I do UX and data vis stuff uh, in general. Um, I was lucky to get involved with these guys because at least it's game related, right? Um, and they've actually used, well, they, it's a startup that started last year. Uh, they're quite big now. They're actually doing championships and they're a big uh, part of that now um, with the Pinnacle deal and all that. They actually hired the student that I was working, one of my students that was working on that. They hired him and they used a lot of his stuff and his prototypes and all our research to get started. And I think my biggest role at the beginning was the data part, like getting a, a generic data format out there. We, we had some open data ideas and we uh, were able to implement that there. So if that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Do we have time for one or two more questions? Yeah. Who's got the weapon and then you have? Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm just very curious about what's your take on esports, maybe on mobile at some point. Right. I don't think there's much difference, right? Uh, in my opinion, I mean, we can everything we're doing here for for League of Legends and Counter Strike and Dota and whatever we can do for mobile. I mean, mobiles on mobile mobile, mobile phones. Um, it's it's a different skill set, I guess, for the players. It's a different setting in a way, but I'm guessing it's quite, I mean, the games are very similar as well. So again, whatever we've developed here, we can reuse there because they're all pretty much copies of each other, if I am allowed to say that in a way, right? Um, so yeah, I, and I think we can take it a bit further because I'm it's maybe not relevant completely to your question, but we're now using a lot of data from the games itself but there's so much data from the players we could use, their you know, physical stuff, uh, like how nervous are they, what's their heart rate and all that, which I think, I'm not sure if they want to agree to that, but it could, you know, it, it could create a bunch of interesting possibilities. If that sort of answers your question, sorry, otherwise we'll just talk later. <laughs> Maybe one last question. All gone. Well. <laughs> Hi. Um, so you talk. You talk about newcomers and uh, advanced players, uh, but do you think uh, we need like flexible streams or flexible ways to represent uh, esports to adapt to each type of uh, user depending on their skills, uh, level of the game, for when they watch the game. Or do we think we need a common, uh, my, my question is not cl very clear, um, like giving a lot of information might be useful for advanced player mm -hmm. and uh, wh what you, you talk about. But beginners, it's going to make the game only more complicated because mm -hmm. it's even more things to look at. So mm -hmm. how do you position how much data do we show? And should we like show multiple ways to watch uh, the same match or only one way, but uh, with very flexible. Uh, no, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of doing it specifically for each target audience. Um, I don't think it. I don't think you can create something that that works for everyone. To be honest, uh, certainly now if you want to get kids involved, like I've got a six-year-old daughter, which I guess you saw a few times on the slide. Um, if I want to introduce her to League of Legends, I mean that's that's very complicated, right? And we'll have to keep it very simple to explain that. Um, and I think, yeah, we should just make, we just look, should look at the different needs in the, you know, and I think the problem is now we're focusing too much on, you know, everyone who's watching these streams already and these people know the games. But if you want to introduce people, it's just like in school, right? People, you know, kids start playing football and then they want to see it on, you know, they see it on TV maybe or whatever. I'm not personally not a big football fan, but um, 
I think it sort of grows like that. And maybe, you know, kids see their parents play at home and then they start, you know, watching these streams as well. But it's very, these games are very, I mean, Counter-Strike is quite straightforward. You know, it's just you kill the other team or you get killed, you plant a bomb, and that's quite straightforward. Still, there's lots of stuff to do there. You've, you've got the tactics of the teams, you've got all these, you know, choke points which you can talk about, which you can visualize to just explain why specific tactics are used and, you know, to help people get better at the game. Um, League of Legends is just, I find it, hor I mean, horrible to follow because there's just so much going on, right? And I'm not that good of a player either. So yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of making things specifically for, uh, maybe for, you know, different generations, different, uh, you know, people with different skills or, or, or different needs. You know, I want to learn about the game, I need, I need a different approach than someone who's an expert and, and wants to. It's, it's like in data visualization in general, when we people, there's this bad tendency of just visualizing all the data and giving like a tool where you can explore it all to experts, it's fine. But I see the same thing being done to make stuff for civilians and it just doesn't work. You need to make something dumbed down than something, you know, you need to talk to your users. And I think I guess that's why we're all here, right? <laughs> all right, thank you so much, Sven. Thank you.